Introduced for the 1982 model year, the Cadillac Cimarron was a $12,131 small car that Cadillac brought to market in a rushed fashion in less than 12 months. The U.S. was in the midst of the second oil crisis. Inflation was at nearly 10%, mortgage rates at 20%, and Cadillac dealers were clamoring for something different than the 121-inch wheelbase DeVille's and Fleetwood's that they had peppering their lots. Dealers were also vigorously threatening Cadillac that if they didn't get a small car, they were going to rip up their franchise contracts and leave the brand. At the same time Cadillac dealers were making these demands, General Motors was also going through a large corporate restructuring and downsizing, as well as rebooting its entire product portfolio to meet new corporate average fuel economy regulations. These issues, when coupled with the urgency of dealer demands, resulted in the 1982 Cimarron being launched with relatively few differences versus other J-Car platform siblings. In fact, the design team was only able to change the grille, wheels, and taillights before production commenced. But the Cimarron story is about so much more than that and really deserves to be told through the eyes of somebody who was there firsthand. Thus, Rare Classic Cars once again brings back John Manoogian, former Cadillac assistant chief designer during the period in which the Cimarron was being developed to discuss the program as well as his sketches for the car and what the design team really desired the Cimarron to be. Let's welcome John back and listen in. Well, welcome back to Rare Classic Cars. Here again with designer, chef, renaissance man, John Manoogie. Thank you, yes to talk about uh, what is, uh, well, how should we describe this vehicle, John? It was a very controversial car for Cadillac and for General Motors. And maybe let's just set the stage a little bit because before we get into the sketch work, as you said in our teaser video, this was Cadillac in panic mode, right? I mean, you had what, six-ish months, nine months to do this? Uh, probably just a little less than a year, yes. It was a very, trying difficult time. If you ever had to read uh, uh, the book in uh, high school English, it was the best of times and it was the oh, worst of Charles times. Dickens. Charles Dickens. Charles yeah, Dickens, yes. Okay. That's what we were up against. And I think what, what, you know, just to set the stage for the viewers, a lot of, a lot of people don't wholly understand it just being in the industry is this is a car and as John said, Cadillac was in panic mode. Absolutely. And the dealers really wanted and were clamoring for something that was a small car and they wanted it fast. So they were going to start fleeing the brand effectively. Right. right? And it was it was the second energy crisis. The, the first one was 73-74. We had just gone through another energy crisis. The dealers were just adamant. They had to have a small fuel efficient Cadillac, number one. Number two, Cadillac needed a vehicle that could uh, uh, compete with the imports. The imports were just beginning to get a toehold, and the 3 Series BMW was the end-all, be-all. So that was the target. That was the target. And they, uh, they gave you no money, and they gave you less <laughs> they gave than a year. Less time and no money. <laughs> Which means... Which means in the auto industry, you're not changing uh, body panels, you're not changing no, glass. Sir. You're, you basically got a grill, taillights, and wheels, and Correct. that was it. Correct. Uh, in the first early years. Yes. Now, I interestingly, you know, John, what's, what I think is going to be great about this episode for the viewers is you're going to see what John's, <laughs> John's thought process was and then juxtapose that with what the car was that came out. So here's the production car sketch, and that's that's the grill on there. Um, we didn't we didn't even get this chrome body side molding, which is interesting because uh, what we have here basically is the grill. We didn't get the driving lights. Uh, we got the wheels, and then we got tail lights. Not these tail lights, but something very close to that. But even this, you know, it has a. I don't know. The coupe is is quite an athletic looking coupe in your rendering here. European looking, yes. Yeah. Yes but just not enough time to do much more than that. No. Given, given the time constraints and the financial constraints we had, this is the best we could do. And you know, I think what's interesting is there were these financial constraints, but the car, 
the Cavalier was selling for in the low 6,000s base price. This was a $12,000 <laughs> base price car. I mean, let's see what we can charge. Yes. Yeah, you know, John and I were just dialoguing ahead of time that you could have bought a Buick Electra for that, cheaper. That's hard to believe, but I believe it. So, yeah. we're just going to say, you know, up front, I'm going to I'm going to tell John that this car was a success because they ended up selling almost 100,000 of these at a price point that was Buick Electra price point. Yes. So must have resonated with some folks. And maybe before we get into the other sketches, John also provided a wonderful um, list of potential names other than the Cimarron here. And I'll just read some, because clearly somebody was on a liquor, <laughs> French, Spanish yes. theme here. Yes. One of which is North Star, by the way, which is interesting. Um, but we have everything from the Fontainebleau to the El Cid, the Cavalry, the Calvados, the Caleche, the Torero, the Dimatis, that's a good one, the Epe, or as it would have been pronounced, the EP, <laughs> you know, like the EPEE, -E -E, the Sans Souci, the Jacquard, the Martinique, um, Valencia, wow, you know, Saguaro, the Escadrille, and I think one of my personal favorites, the Lamplighter. So, <laughs> You know, imagine pulling up to your friend's house and, oh, what's that nice car in the driveway there? That's my lamp lighter. I believe also, and I guess I'd have to go back and verify this, but the this, a sales manager for Cadillac was Braz Pryor, mm. who was a Texan. And I think oh. the Cimarron name, he gravitated toward that. And so that's, I believe, how they made that decision. He liked those horned rams. <laughs> and the, that was, yes. was that ever the logo for the car? Or no, no, thank no. goodness, no. Okay, it was no. just it was just the, uh, okay. A diversion, yes. I did see Pegasus on here, which was an early version, an early name for the Fiero, too. Yes, too. yes. Hence and there's, the there's some uh, familiar names on there, like like you said, North Star, uh, that ultimately wound up being used. But some of these clearly did not, you know, the Buccaneer, the Banco, or the Bolero. <laughs> yes. So this this was your blue sky proposal. Okay, so these uh, these were done with the idea that as a next generation from the Cavalier based car, we would get unique sheet metal and do what we thought was right. So my basic ideas were very European influenced. Uh, very clean, very flush, aerodynamic. This was pre-aero era. Uh, the Taurus hadn't quite come out yet. So I was looking at ways to get a very unique Cadillac look. Uh, the wheels are cheated too big, but that's okay. Uh, that was one <laughs> of my things. But uh, other than that, it, it would have made, I think, a very attractive, handsome Cimarron. I think the amazing thing about these as well, John, is this is done in the early 80s, 1982. Yes, between 1980 and 82. So think about this in the context, particularly what GM was producing at yes. the time. Yes, yes. And this car looks like it's, you know, would be at home 10, 15 years later almost on the road. Oh, thank you, yes. It's, yeah. it's pretty amazing. Now, unfortunately, uh, we all know you didn't get any unique sheet metal. No. So the finance guys put the kibosh on you pretty early, right? Pretty much, yes. You did this fancy rendering uh, that uh, they said, nope, sorry. You're Wallpaper, gonna... yes. Wallpaper. Yes. Good job. Thank you for... Thank thanks. you very much. Thanks for now that. Now go back and sit on, yeah. <laughs> um, this was, interestingly enough, an Opal-based uh, design where we would have taken the, the uh, Opal and transformed it into a Cadillac with... Uh, unique front end sheet metal wheels, uh, body side moldings and taillights. <clears throat> Again, uh, this would have been more European and probably Americans wouldn't have uh, recognized the fact that it was an Opal. Now, Buick had a history of using Opals, but uh, this never got beyond the sketch stage. So this was the early caddy that zigged? So to speak, yes. <laughs> the Katera was yet to be born. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. And then this was a proposal for, after the first generation uh, J-Car Cimarron, this would have been if we had gotten our own hood, 
uh, grill, lower fascia, lower body side uh, molding, cladding, wheels. And you eventually got some of this as the car progressed. Too. Uh, as it progressed, yes. Uh, a couple of years after the initial car came out, we were able to get some of this, yes. It was interesting. I think, you know, 1984, 85 was the best sales year with almost 25,000 of these sold. And I think by then it started getting some of the unique, more unique components. 82 was a rough, rough year for the Cimarron, but... We never did get the headlight washers, but... Uh, <laughs> that would have been a unique touch. Another European touch, yes. I don't think actually, I don't think there's... Has there been a Cadillac with a headlamp wiper? Not a wiper. I don't believe so, no. Yeah. No. These were blue, blue sky. What if Cimarron's? Uh, if Cadillac were to do a very unique styled uh, small car these were just cranking these out I, again i just can't get over the fact that this is the early 80s yes you no know? i mean this yes. is uh, this was pre-taurus uh, pre uh mercury sable wow oops i was uh doing the arrow thing notice too you know we talked about the last time the lower belt lines that was a big thing uh during this era was getting the belt lines much lower, giving you a feeling of airy uh, interior. It's not something that you have today anymore. No, it, actually the trend has gone just the other way. The belt lines have come up. A lot of that is uh, a psychological thing with maybe feeling secure, whereas these were, you were much more exposed, much more open. Mm. Neither one is right or wrong, just preference. I like this, though. You don't need the blind spot monitoring system to <laughs> right. back out of Visibility you know. is much easier, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and again, just uh, we, did a, we did a clay model of this particular sketch, which uh, okay. we can... We can this, yeah. this was kind of the precursor sketch to this clay model, which was full size, out on the patio. Now, again, we didn't get a lot of what I had in the sketch, but there was a two-tone scheme. There was a unique upper, unique sheet metal on the front with lower fascias. It was uh, our version of what could be as a next generation. Here's a great one with kind of the progression too yes. that you have. Yes. And you know, again, like you said, you see the transition from the sketch and then to the more right. production. And uh, just as another kind oh, of yeah. a. This one's my favorite. Framework here is this was one of the full-size airbrush renderings that I had done, which was a precursor to doing uh, some of the full-size clays that we had done later. My goodness. Uh, What's amazing, again, dated May of 1982. This is yeah. a 1982 rendering. Yeah, long time ago, 40 years ago. Wow. Scary. That's a, that's a great looking. Thank you. Car. Thanks. Yeah. So that was, uh, keep in mind also that when we were doing that, we were also finishing up the uh, DeVille Fleetwood. We were just beginning the Eldorado Seville for the downsized 86 cars. Ah. And as a side job, we wanted to do a proposal which would compete with the uh, Italians to do the two-seat Cadillac. So we had a lot of spinning plates in the air. Now mm. Here's here's a uh, unique one with the skirted rear. I uh, I was really enamored with the Citroëns and Cadillacs of old that had skirted rear wheels. And I often entertain the idea of what would a smaller car look like with skirts. I, I'm not so sure it would have worked, but it, in a sketch form, you know, paper's cheap. I've said that before. <laughs> uh, why not just take a look at it? I may have done some full-size uh, tape drawings and renderings, but at the end of the day, we always kept the rear wheels open, at least on the smaller cars. Uh, maybe on a big limousine, it might be more appropriate. And you were really going away from the three-box uh, style. Uh, here, yes, sure. yes. Th this had a much, much higher deck lid uh, I had spent a lot of time in the wind tunnel. A GM had just opened their wind tunnel oh, that's in right. 79 or 80. And uh, so we were just getting used to using the wind tunnel 
with our full size work. We used to send it to uh, Georgia, but when GM opened its own tunnel, we had access to the tunnel 24 seven. So I got to spend a great deal of time uh, developing, mm. uh, well, the downsized uh, Eldorado and some other vehicles. So I was, I was consciously trying to get this aero improvement for fuel economy because fuel economy was such a strong mm. uh, element back then. So the higher deck lid, faster profile. And you clearly had, given it was a Day S inspired, you were going to have this rear fender be removable with one <laughs> bolt, and you were going to have the hydro. There would have been a cut line there somewhere. A cut yes. line there, yeah. yeah somewhere. It was I just have, forgot that. You forgot that one. Yeah. And the hydro pneumatic suspension, yeah. so you could raise it. And, and the 23 it. inch wheels, of and course. And the 23 inch wheels. So I'm sure, you know, and, <laughs> and that uh, wonderful 88 horsepower sewing machine under hood would have and, had no issue. And the pillars behind the glass. Let's not oh. forget that. Let's not forget that. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's unique. With a sketch, you can do anything. I just can't get over that this is, you know, early 80s. I mean, that's... Yeah. 40 years ago. Wow. Now, here you're starting to get that the prow of the hood. Yeah, the... these were... Uh, the, we need to back up a little bit because these were probably done as the next generation from the original car. So this would have, again, required a new hood, uh, headlamps, fascias, and grill, but it would, given, uh, it would have given the car more of a Cadillac look that I thought was lacking in the first car in that we could only get a grill texture and most mm. people, including myself, thought it looked too much like a Chevrolet. Whereas this would have given us a little a stronger identity in terms of what Cadillac's faces were like. Mm. And I always liked to incorporate driving lamps back then. That was a that was a big deal with European cars. And so I thought that would be a, a nice touch uh, to give us that Euro look. And I got the wipers on the headlamps again. This was also pre-composite uh, lamp era. That's right, because that was what, 84, 84 Lincoln. Lincoln, the Mark 7. There's a whole story about that. We'll tell some other time. But Lincoln uh, introduced it on their, uh, uh, was that the Mark? I think it was the yeah, Mark. Mark 7. For, for 84. Yeah. And uh, General Motors at the time was convinced that composite lamps would never be approved. But we so know you today... Were... You were foreshadowing. We I know think. today that that wasn't true. Yeah. But these uh, these next um, two are something These are like. all, uh, again, blue sky, what if. Uh, we did a Cimarron that was all new, unique. Love the wraparound. Spend the money. All the way. Uh, that was kind of a Seville thing, you know, where we didn't do the vertical tail lamps. Cadillac and vertical tail lamps are synonymous, but on the Seville it was a horizontal, so I thought, well, we can incorporate that as kind of a unique Cadillac uh, treatment. Again, notice how low the belt line is, uh, like that full-size tape drawing mm -hmm. I had where there's an offset between where the height of the backlight and the windshield are and where the belt line digs into the body side. Mm. That does a couple things. It gives you, uh, obviously, much more glass, much more light, but it also slims the body down. If you look at many of the cars on the road today, the bodies tend to look much thicker, and that's because the belt lines are higher. Mm. And this has, you have the low belt line, you also have the low cowl, kind of the low uh, hood. Uh, yes, now, whether I could have gotten away with the lack of bumper offsets on that, I guess. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's in production true. today on today's cars. Back then, no. Yeah, no, fair enough. I was using uh, what we used to call artistic license. Same with the wheels and tires there. Absolutely, right? yeah. The car had 13 inch wheels when it first came out. I like the extraction vents on this so, one, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the rear. Let's that, uh, yes, yeah. I didn't know, I don't know what that 1.8 liter engine, if the car could go that fast, <laughs> you know, to get the ram air. Through, of course, right, right. right. And uh, as one of your other videos where there were the, the uh, deck lid louvers on the riv, I, I put these louvers in here as kind of an interior uh, extractor. Hey, 
Why not? I do notice there's a lack of a luggage rack on the trunk, John. You didn't. There is a lack of a luggage. What happened there? You didn't if want you, that. On the if blue you if you go back to the original Cimarron, it was uh, introduced with a chrome luggage rack, um, which was supposed to be a Euro influence. I wasn't buying any of that, but nonetheless, the the original car had that. Again, uh, just some different ideas with how the backlight could wrap around uh, with the lower belt line being where it was. Uh, mm. You'll notice in almost all of these sketches, the body sides were very, very clean, uh, lacking body side moldings as such. Some of them had lower cladding, some of them don't. Uh, this would have had a two-tone breakup along this line here just to slim the body down a little bit. But I was really into the high uh, deck lids for aero reasons. Mm. So you which were, you were ultimately, ahead of your time there, Which Dolby? ultimately Pain. Chris Bangle put on the 7 Series BMWs. <laughs> so why, you know, was there at the senior leadership levels, was there just a, um, a lack of enthusiasm for these kind of shapes and still a desire to emulate more of that 76 to 9 Seville profile? As we mentioned, the... Taurus Sable hadn't come out quite yet and no one was convinced that the uh, high deck lids uh, we had just gotten off of the Mitchell era and Mitchell was just the opposite he wanted the rears low if you look at most of Mitchell's cars they they always had a tapered rear yes. and a tapered front and the ultimate expression of that was the four rotor Corvette which is one of my all-time favorite designs. Oh, the silver. Era, but it's but, yeah. but it's tapered at both ends, and he was adamant. He didn't like cars that had real tall deck lids, mm. and I think that comment about too bad Arrow had to go that way may have been one of Bill's comments. But nonetheless, in the wind tunnel, a, a higher rear end generally got us much better numbers than a lower rear end. So my sketches try to embody what you could do with a higher rear end for aero reasons, but senior management hadn't been convinced yet until the Taurus and the Sable came out. Mm. Then everything changed. Everything changed. I'm glad you mentioned that. That aero vet, the four rotor vet, was a great looking car. One of my all time five top designs. And uh, interestingly, uh, one in which the seats don't move, only the pedals do. It's a fixed seating uh, position. Correct. And then it has yes. those gauges that move with the wheel. Very cool. To, that, that car, I was a student at Art Center when that car came out. And when I saw that car, I said, I have to be where they're doing that car. And then when Eagle picked it up on there, <laughs> then the pod, you know, the instrument class, you said, yeah. gosh, that's a great idea, yeah, right? Yeah. And again, this is another view of that uh, clay model that we showed. I just can't get over the, the blue sky versus the... Reality. Reality. Yeah. So, you know. And speaking of blue sky. Oh, okay. As, as a closing, <laughs> <laughs> believe it or not, kids, this was a, uh, I did a full size. And when you do a full size, you've got to be serious about it. You don't show something full size that you're not really committed to. And I did this uh, with the idea that let's, let's do something really far out really arrow and uh and we'll call it a summer well i mean it's amazing to me john like i said looking back to these sketches these are all pre taurus able pre 1980s yes early 80s yes and your the vision that you had you know for the car epitomized by you know kind of something like this and then what actually came out you get a sense of what the constraints were really at the time too we, we our hands were just so bound with constraints from financial, manufacturing, and it needs to be said, GM was going through a very difficult period. They were downsizing every car in the lineup. They were procuring Hughes and EDS. Uh, they were reorganizing with uh, CPC, BOC, that's Chevrolet Pontiac Canada, Buick Olds uh, Cadillac. They were announcing Saturn. There was so much going on. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. 
And so that was, that, that was the environment that these cars were being developed in. And there just wasn't enough money uh, to go around to mm. do this kind of thing for the small cars when we still had to worry about what were we going to do with the downsized El Dorado Seville for 86. The 84 hadn't quite hit the ground quite yet. Mm. There were a lot of a lot of unknowns. Looking back, I think it's easy to say this was the wrong decision. It was tough. Imagine you're a Cadillac general manager at the time, and you've got to decide between pushing out a car that you know is imperfect, yes, but will appease the dealer body, yes, and will get buy you time to basically get you something that you want. And the car evolved to that with the V6 that came out in '85, right. right. some more unique sheet metal. And I, I think they got it right. Toward the end, when they added the V6 and they they tuned up the exterior a little bit, it, I think it was good then. But it was too little, too late. I was joking with a friend that it was the best running Cadillac, and it, it didn't have the 4.1 V8. <laughs> didn't have the diesel. Didn't have the diesel. Oh God, yeah, it didn't have any diesel. It had the 2.8 V6 was actually a really nice engine in these. Uh, yes, it was quite yeah. peppy. Yeah. So I think John, you know, the fact that. The first year they sold, I think, 25,000. The next year in 83, around 20,000. Then each year until 87, 8, it's selling 20, 25,000 a year. You know, one, it's, it's funny for me to look back at this stuff too. I, I think it needs to be said that there was so much talent at GM design. And I think people lose sight of that because of the production cars that we right. were doing. But there was so much talent that could have done so much cool stuff that just never saw the light of day. Well, we should probably end on that note. <laughs> I think that's a good note to end on. So hopefully the viewers enjoyed this and got a chance to see, you know, like I said, the, the sketches from John here uh, in artwork of a car that I think is probably misunderstood, obviously was flawed, but in the midst of that environment, I think it's kind of easy to say that it was the wrong decision. It appeased the, the dealer body, it ended up selling 100,000 cars plus over its lifetime and, and being priced above the Buick Electra. So, Which is, again, it's hard for me to compute, but that, no, yes. One thing I should also probably add as a caveat, which I think Mark does also, everything that we see here is is me it's not the corporation it's not i'm not speaking for general motors here this is all my opinions sure my viewpoint just so we get that on the table my yes same with me well i used to work for gm but no longer it's, okay uh, that's our caveat that's right it's, it's my opinion and it's your opinion but we're right right john <laughs> we're correct often wrong never in doubt that's right that's right well, thanks so much uh, for watching. Thank you, John, again for Thank this. Thank you. More with John coming up very soon.